My name is Bayo Akomalafe, and I'm speaking to you from my little, little room in Chennai in India. I want to begin with gratitude as well um, to my son and daughter. I just rushed to hug them before this began. You know, it's a way of seeking permission to do what I do. And um, um, well, well, let me really begin in my way of making us welcome to say that this is a very difficult invitation to articulate what I'm inviting us to be here and to do here <clears throat> together. Um, because there's nothing more scandalous to the modern mind than addresses that are shifting, right? Um, the sense that we have a schema, you know, we have ways of convening and galvanizing and mobilizing the world and understanding our role in it. It's very difficult to meet the trickster. It's very difficult to have one's algorithms, one's, you know, apartment upended by a storm, you know, <laughs> or disturbed by some kind of trickster. So I want to really begin with a prayer. And um, this prayer would be our collective prayer. But before we get to that, I would like to offer a story, right? A story to frame this adventure. I know because we're speaking about trauma, among other things, you might think that my story is, or the things I'm about to say are trigger warnings. No, I do not participate in some of the moralities that are, you know, enacted in the global north. Right. I am from Nigeria. I'm from a different part of the world. I'm culturally situated and limited by that space. And so I'm not often a trigger warning. I'm often an invitation. Think of this as a form of radical hospitality that invites you into even different forms of displacement. It is said where I come from that when the trickster shows up, when the trickster disturbs, that's when emancipation is possible. But a trickster's gift does not come without some kind of shift, some kind of loss. So this is why my invitation is difficult to articulate. But let me share a story. And some of you, many of you, my friends here, have heard this story ad nauseum. I tell this story all the time. And I was thinking of a different one to tell today, but this one wanted to be told. So I'm going to tell it. Anyway, eventually I will be boring, and I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay. Um, remember, this is not a trigger warning or a PSA announcement or anything of the sort. This is me offering you kolanot, right, which is a ritual in eastern Nigeria that is meant to say you are welcome, and all the things that are absent are also welcome. The story is a story of libations. Right. Um, when I was growing up, my I used to watch elders around me in parties or in festive situations offer libations. A libation, you might already know, is the pouring of drink to the earth. Some words would attend this pouring of drink to the earth. And I always felt it was a perfectly good waste of wine or whatever drink was in vogue at that at that moment it didn't make sense to me it was when i became a young or younger academic that the story of the libation came to me as this deeply spiritual african technology that was passed down to us across and dispersed across the african continent and I think beyond the African continent, from the ancient world of Kemet. Kemet is the old name for what we now call Egypt. Right? The story is told that a certain god, Ra, um, and there are many iterations of this story, like all myth, uh, this, uh, this is one version of that story. Ra was this very flamboyant and drunk god 
who threw a tantrum one day when people started to make fun of him and his intoxicated habits. And so he marched right up to heaven um, and he stayed there. And while he was angry, his daughter, who also happens to be his mother, who also happens to be his sister, who also happens to have other kinds of relationships with him, you know, Hathor, came to him and said, what ails you, my Lord? And Ra responded, those people, you know, down there, they're disturbing. They're, they're making me mad. I would like you to go down there and destroy all of them, kill all of them. I told this story at my first visit to Sand in October 2019, before everything went to dust, so to speak. I remember it with my story when I was speaking about climate change. It's quite appropriate here, too. And um, Hathor went down to earth and destroyed everything or started to destroy everything. And she was efficient at her work. Um, she left no stone unturned, no body, you know, unharmed. She would take bodies and rip them and tear them into pieces and leave puddles of blood in her wake and then turn around and drink up the puddles of blood and retire for the night. This lasted many years and no one knew what to do. I mean, the communities of humans started to pray to Ra and Ra was like, okay, you know, maybe this is enough. Hathor, you can come back up now. It's enough. I'm, I'm fine. But her thought could not be stopped. She was like an imperative that had no leash. And so Ra and the humans and other gods, I, two of which I cannot remember their names right now, convened, you know, they came to a gathering. I think Maurice, Mauricio and Zaya were the curators of this gathering. It was a conference of some kind. And they sat together and they thought together. All your solutions couldn't work. In one iteration of this story, a child spoke up and said, how about, how about this? How about you trick Hathor? How about we pour red wine to the ground and then we trick Hathor into thinking that's blood that she left from the night before? And so Hathor woke the next day and saw blood or what looked like blood. And she drank from it, confused. And she got intoxicated by it. And then she went back to sleep. And the same thing happened the next day. Every time she resumed her imperatives, she was interrupted by, her, by, in, by the intoxicating red wine that was poured to the earth. And that is how that tradition, that generational tradition of offering libations, this is a story of how libations came to be the spiritual technology right? But what does it do, really? What, what is the invitation here? We pour libations on the continent of Africa in many of the traditions that I know about, especially the Yoruba traditions, we, and even Igbo people in eastern Nigeria. Nigeria is a nation of more than 200 nations, right? And more than, I think, 700 tongues. So it's a lot of people, the largest black nation on earth, and we all offer libations, right? But we do it to remind ourselves that we are sustained by a trick, right? We do it to remind ourselves that there is no form of celebration that is not already a form of mourning, right? We do it to touch the circumstances that make us possible, that in a sense, we are not, um, let me put it this way, we are not independent of all the trouble around us, right? It's a way of co-enacting the trouble, of remembering it so that we can forget it. It's almost like that traditional psychodynamic notion of trauma, something that is so powerful that it cannot be remembered, and in which therapy is an attempt to help us remember it so we can forget it. Right. So it's a co-enactment of trouble. It's like we're bringing trouble. It's the way we pray to issue the trickster. We say, issue, please come close, but not too close. <laughs> right. So it's like we invite trouble 
but we don't want it to come too close. We invite blessings, but we don't want to be entirely embraced by blessings. We want just a little crack of trouble to remain because immediately we find ourselves in some kind of utopia. We will forget the circumstances that led us to that place and we will repeat the trauma over and over again, right? So this is why we offer a libation. And I want to um, use that to frame this invitation and my invitation to you to pray together. We're going to pray together as a cohort. And this will launch our four-day workshop. Um, the prayer is on a slide. I'm just going to get to it in a moment. Do I have power? Okay, I do. Everyone, please let me know if you can see this. Just give it a thumbs up. You can, great, awesome. I always prepare wonderful slides to impress you. Let's start from the beginning. I'm calling this Everyone Comes With Its Own World, at least this, this session. Um, so just a few things to get um, to attend to this invitation that I'm making to prayer as a form of welcome. This event that I call the Wandering Winding Way of the Wound is an attempt to mobilize, to convene, to touch other notions and other understandings of what we call trauma, the psychic wound. It's, a, it's especially, and I think this is most uh, something I want, really want to uh, emphasize. And by the way, we'll be jumping in and out of text throughout this workshop. You know, there are many things I don't want to forget, so I'm committing them to the slides. Um, another good thing about that is I like to share my notes afterwards. So I will be sharing this afterwards. But let me get through this, and we will invite ourselves into prayer together. We want to also notice what is left out by the dominant ideas of trauma that we make, right? There are cross-cultural notions of trauma that are immediately invisibilized or backgrounded by dominant theories of trauma. This is an attempt to stay with some of them, okay? This is also about making care, right? In a different way, making care. You know, the idea here is not to fix anyone, is not to help you feel better, even though that's important. Right? It's not to teach you coping strategies. It's not to offer therapeutic help. You know, this is a severely limited vocation. This four-day adventure we are convening here, right? I admit that. Um, but it's a different kind of making care with the world. Um, it is staying with the trouble of what has been lost in how we think about trauma. I also want to say this, that because this is framed in, mostly framed, at least from my perspective, some of my friends are going to be joining us in the coming days, Sophie Strand, um, uh, Tyson Yun Kapota, Vanessa Andriotti. Um, there's a thick thread of indigeneity that runs through it, right? But anytime, you know, sometimes when we think about the indigenous, we immediately start thinking of a pure archive of solutions that we can just grab anytime you want to. And I want to refuse that. I want to resist that a little. The indigenous is not just there to attend to the needs of the modern, right? It's not just waiting like, um, I get this question all the time. In fact, I was asked this question by a huge German cultural institute that invited me to keynote one of their events. They were like, so tell us, how do we fix climate change? What does your culture have to offer? What are we missing? And I was like, you're missing nothing. You have it all together, right? That's the problem. And we don't have solutions for you. Right. So this is not an attempt to, this is not some capitalist extractivist attempt to just take out intact an already made archival or archived solution or notion that contradicts dominant theories of trauma. If anything, indigeneity is about troubling coloniality. So we're staying with the trouble, not just accessing something that is already made. Right. 
This is compassionate inquiry. I'm libating the grounds here, my people. This is compassionate inquiry, right? And by compassionate inquiry, I do not mean safety. I do not mean that we will arrive at consensus. I do not even mean democratic notions, important notions, they, uh, though they may be of consent. I'm not speaking about consent. I'm not speaking about full disclosure. I'm not speaking about transparency, right? I am of a black tradition that refuses transparency. You might even think of it as occultic. Um, some of the philosophers that are my elders speak about the right to opacity, the refusal of disclosure. I am of that tradition. Um, you might find some difficulty in thinking about compassion through those lenses, but stay with the trouble just a little bit. And hopefully we might come to a place where we recognize in some animist fashion that a trickster is also a form of blessing, right? This is not an attempt at dismissing suffering or pain, right? This is usually an accusation leveled against philosophers or academics or public intellectuals, that you're abstracting away the real material consequences of thinking and talking about trauma in the ways that you are. But I'm not in, um, I'm not embracing or dismiss, or I'm not embracing an attempt to dismiss, let me put it that way, suffering or pain. Instead, this is an attempt to think about the ways we make sense of suffering and pain. We need good abstractions, I say here, right? But that's beside the point. That's just jara, as Yoruba people would say. What we're attempting to do here is to stay with the trouble of how we convene our notions of suffering. What is left behind when we do that? And what is brought into the room when we do that? This is very important to me. This is a speculative and non-encyclopedic adventure, right? I don't have it all together. I do not have some divine source that I'm, except Maurizio, but, but apart from Maurizio, I don't have some divine library where this is downloaded from, right? I just know that there is a strand woven through the fabric of the contemporaneous that is inviting playful, troubling, playful, autistic engagement with the things that we think we know. And I mentioned autistic for a specific reason that some of you might already be in terms with, right? It's speculative, but yet grounded. It's grounded in and situated in other realities that are not just based in the city or in the global north or in the traditions in the West, in the US and in, the, in Europe, that there are other worlds and they are thinking as well about these matters. Right? There are other linguistic traditions, other rites of passage that are usually left out when we speak about trauma. So this is not encyclopedic. And I will say many terms, I will, I will mention many things that you say, no, that's not the definition I knew about that. It's fine, you see. There are semantic multiplicities at large. The, the way that I speak about healing may not be the way you've heard of it ever. But the invitation, again, the welcome here, the invitation is take a note, you know, make notes about these, these concepts, make notes about the differences, note the differences, not only where things align with what you already know, right? Sniff out nuances and trouble your perspectives, as I hope to trouble mine, and I already do that. This convening is a troubling of perspectives, right? What we want to do is to defamiliarize, that is to make a little bit stranger, to denaturalize, that is to think of it as not already there, but as a co-constructive, productive, generative effort that has agency. It's not just there or given. It is something that we do. And by we, I mean humans and non-humans. We want to repoliticize to say, that trauma is a given or is obvious, invisibilizes the genealogies and the histories that gave birth to the theory, right? Trauma did not just sprout unbidden 
from history, right? It is historical, it is colonial, it is imperial, it is part of troubling histories, right? So it is not just obvious, right? And that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to repoliticize it, not to pathologize it, not to say it's bad, that's different, but to situate it within emergence. And then finally, we want to de-anthropocize. And I made up that word because I couldn't find a word to capture what I wanted to share with you, to de-anthropocize. And it might be in the dictionary, I don't know. It sounded made up to me. Um, we make up words all the time. To de-anthropocize is to decenter the human individual from our frameworks of trauma. That seems like a shocking thing to do and a shocking thing to consider. But that is what we want to do together because the view is shocking from this side of the world. I tell you. Through our four days together, I think it's better I read this one. You'll hear from other public intellectuals, from yourselves, from special guests of mine whose stories are powerful. I'm so excited to introduce to you tomorrow, not just the, one, um, the publicized teachers that will be coming, but persons like Kim Crutcher, um, an African-American big sister of mine that I met recently and who, who has a powerful story to tell um, about trauma. I love listening to her. She'll, she'll join us tomorrow. Um, um, and then Professor Wendy Holloway, um, who told me recently that psychology is the policeman of capitalism. There's a lot to um, listen to and to share. So here's what I've already said. I'd like you to make notes, to think slowly, to let things land and churn, to be slow to swallow, right? Swish it around in your mouth before you gulp it. And you you have my full blessings and permission to spit it out anytime you want, right? to spit it out later. You don't have to swallow everything. Right? This is not truth. Tricksters don't dabble in truth. We dabble in possibility and play. Okay. And then use some of these insights to interrogate your perspectives, seek out patterns and differences instead of critique. You know, the downside of critique is that it demobilizes its object. And it says, this is what you are, and I'm going to try to negate you in order to arrive or to prop myself up because I'm closer to the truth of things. And that way of seeing the world does not really allow for its richness to emerge, right? So think about what the tree, what the tree's critique is of the river. Do trees critique rivers? Do clouds critique mountains? Or do they diffractively play with these entities, even when they constitute obstacles? Right. So this is the invitation, my people. Finally, this inquiry is died. This is a Lagos Nigerian phrase, died and buried. Died and buried in issues, transatlantic cartographical project. I will not tell you that story now, but in time I will tell you about the voyages of black bodies across the Atlantic and how a trickster is said to have traveled with them instead of trying to heal the wound that was colonial intervention. And it is from this place of pain that I speak from. You know, I, I speak from pain and suffering and invisibilization and toxic heaps of gas and mountains of recyclable materials dumped from the West outside of my home and outside of the buildings that I lived in as a, as a kid growing up in Africa, in Nigeria. I know what it is to be in pain, but my people kind of have a sense of things that living in pain ushers us into new ways of being in the world, right? Um, that may not be available if we seek to climb out to the surface.